Hi everybody, welcome to the Poetry Vlog. Julie, what can everybody expect out of today's episode? Well, we are going to be talking about poetry in relation to installation art and dance, a little bit of dance history and a little bit of, um, I guess, philosophy or theory <laughs> around um, the meeting and the, and the blending of, of selves and matter. Great. Um, for students watching, you should, by the end of this episode, have some new critiques of the essay you read by Jesse Lichtenstein and some new ideas for multimodal collaborations. Yeah. Um, I want to thank the Mellon Foundation for providing this amazing equipment. I feel very professional. Appreciation. <laughs> um, and then remember to subscribe and like the video to support the Poetry Vlog. It's a free way to offer support, but helps with getting my own URL. And visit thepoetryvlog.com for anything else I'd otherwise name right here. Links below in the description. And uh, the call for comments today is we want to hear if you've done collaborative work across mediums, so poets with dancers or artists and vice versa. And if you haven't, what's been the barrier for you from doing that work? And if you don't want to respond to that, I'm curious to hear if any folks in the audience have any experience with writing that's informed by the movement-based practices or vice versa. Yeah. All right, wonderful. So I hope you all enjoyed today's episode and we'll talk to you by the end of it again. Today we have Julie Carr with us, um, which is an enormous privilege, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Julie, will you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hello, I am Julie Carr. Um, let's see, I'm in Seattle because I gave a reading and led a class last night at Bothell. Bothell? Bothell. Bothell. I like the um, bell better. <laughs> Fancy. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I was reading from this new book which is called Real Life and Installation, which I'll read a couple poems from. Um, this is a book of poetry, but also prose, and it happens to be my 10th book, so it has that magic number 10 attached yeah. to it. Um, That's amazing, yeah. actually. Yeah. And uh, C asked me to mention a couple of books that I wanted to recommend to anyone who's watching. So two books that I've read recently that have kind of blown my mind. Um, one is called NOS, N-O-S, and it's uh, by Matthew Cooperman and Abby Kapong. It's a collaborative book about raising a child with um, autism um, and, and also uh, other disabilities which are not otherwise specified, and that's what, where the title comes from. Uh, I found this book to be uh, just very moving, but also very, very innovative in its use of form and language. And then the other book is an older book by uh, somebody named Avery Gordon. Oh, and, uh, sorry. Do you know Avery <laughs> yeah. Gordon? Oh, okay. I love Avery okay. Gordon's work. I'm very it's like excited cornerstone about... to the theory pieces of my oh, dissertation, okay. actually. I'm so excited about Avery Gordon. So yeah. Avery Gordon, the older book is called Ghostly Matters, yep. and that is a book about haunting and fi figures yeah, of ghostliness. Yeah, it's like literally mm -hmm. the method for my whole dissertation. This is um, <laughs> Sorry, strange. Like this is strange because every <laughs> minute since I read that book, I'm meeting people whose who's like, lives are structured around that book. Yeah. And this is probably not true for me. So, um, yeah. but her also new book, um, which is called um, The Hawthorne Archives, Letters from the Utopian Margins. I have it, but I yes. haven't read it. Crazy it was really beautiful. I was at like a book fair and I was yes. like, this is on sale? Yes. <laughs> so both of those books. So check out Avery Gordon. Yeah. And and uh, their work. Yeah. That just made me so yeah. excited. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. We'll talk more about that off yeah. camera. Um, okay. And so then the other thing I just wanted to mention, something about me. Um, uh, well, one thing would be that I have three children um, and they show up in my work quite a bit. The, one of them is really no longer a child because he's 21. What are the uh, ages of 11, 17, and 21. 
Yes. And the 11 year old Lucy, uh, not in what I'll read here, but if you read the book later, you would see that she's yeah. kind of all throughout. Um, and then another thing I'll mention is that uh, with my partner Tim, we run a space called Counterpath in Denver, mm -hmm. and lots and lots of things happen at Counterpath, but the thing that I'm kind of most passionate about right now is the community garden cool. that we run and raise food and give it away. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Will you read for us? <clears throat> sure. Um, so uh, one thing in this book is that there are a series of imagined or kind of dreamed uh, um, hypothetical art installations. And that theme, which runs through the book, starts with the piece that I'm going to read, which were two dreams, um, actual dreams that I had, uh, and that I, after I had these dreams and sort of thought about them, they started to seem like art installations to me, um, the kind of performances, kind of art installations. Mm -hmm. so, this is two dream installations on practice. My neighbor and I decide to create a commune made up of dancers, artists, and activists. But first we must train them. We gather them into a room and we begin a long, slow dance. The purpose of this dance is to teach people how to support one another and to be supported. Therefore, there's a lot of falling, catching, and lifting. When the dance is over, I say, tomorrow's dance will be a lot more precise. What I have in mind involves touching one another's arms and hands, examining with all of our senses the split second between not touching and touching. The second one, the kids and I are in someone else's apartment. The person who lives there is not home. We are looking through the rooms with urgency, opening drawers and cabinets, lifting objects from desks and countertops, staring at photographs, reading mail. We are, it seems, trying to find the person by examining all of their belongings. This is something we do regularly. It's a practice. But in this case, since we ourselves once lived in this apartment, even as we are looking for the other person, we are also looking for ourselves underneath or within that person's things, underneath or within that person. So uh, there's another poem that I want to read, but uh, yeah. should I read that now? I would love so that. it's called All That Is Solid or What I Know About the Body. Fluid sits in the ear waiting for sound. The nervous system holds memories of pain and pleasure for an entire lifetime. Tightness in the palate or tongue causes corresponding tightness in the pelvic floor and cervix. The diaphragm flutters. The earliest movement is the movement of a starfish. Eyes dart upward. Lungs rise on a diagonal plane, one of the few diagonals in the body. Touch stimulates, stimulates brain growth. Oxytocin fires in bursts. If touched, wounds heal faster. An aura of Mother Mary Blue shines above the head. Middle finger is connected to liver. Something beats in the back of the skull. Hormone from the Greek impetus or onset or rush. The onset of darkness secreted by the brain is affected not only by the time of day but also by the season. Blue light suppresses sleep. Depression lodges between vertebrae, fear in the muscles of the head. Over time, the feet lose sensation, fat lives in the eyes. Just before death, feet and hands and purple. Desire is imaginary. Beginning, we are two. Concluding, we are one. Teeth go first, last longest. A chip in a bone will not heal. The brain will be lost, becoming only ambient teleology. Mm, thank you. Yes. I actually really love that you read both because you're right. Mm -hmm. It's like you went from up here to yeah. just being in it. Do you have a preference when you're writing? Like, do you find it easier or more difficult to write about bodies from the observational standpoint mm -hmm. or from the like actually being inside of it and the different parts to it? I guess if we're talking about easier, it's probably easier to write uh, descriptively. Okay. Right. So, so, so to kind of visually imagine yeah. or even observe a scene of bodies moving yeah. and to 
uh, to narrate that yeah. than it is to do the work of kind of um, experiencing your own physicality yeah. and somehow find language for that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's an essay by Karen Barad called mm -hmm. Transmateriality. Mm -hmm. Have you read it? Well, Karen Barad was my teacher. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, no way. <laughs> but before she did any of that theoretical work, so she was a physicist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, like, I'm like and, in awe uh, of Karen right. Barad's brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she is a She might inspiring. have read some of the most like mind-opening work that I've read. Because mm -hmm. there's a thing with scholarship where, because it's all kind of in the same discourse community, mm -hmm. it can start to feel like you kind of know where it's going and you get the idea. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. People are sharing the same idea and passing it around. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking of it when you were talking about that kind of touching and that like materiality yeah. to it. Yeah, um, I mean, not to get too far away from where yeah. we thought we'd go, but um, <laughs> the the idea of sort of trans material is really important to me yeah. to what I'm writing right now, which is a prose book and a history book about American history. And the first chapter is about mud um, and swamps oh and gosh. marinage and yeah. swamps as a trans material. Mm -hmm. And then the chapter that I'm writing right now, which is why the yeah. Avery Gordon is important, is about ghosts yeah. and haunting and ghosts as a kind of um, trans identity. Yeah. Yeah. These The poems that I read highlight both kind of the body, performance, installation, work, and also dream and ordinary yeah. life. Yeah. Um, what I like is that when you talk about the body, the mm -hmm. stage, performance work, what you're also pushing is, is it having that article of the attached to it? Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. um, oftentimes people say the body to assume a sort of containedness, and it mm -hmm. sounds like you're more interested in the body as always uncontained. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Right? Or like instead yeah. of the subject who's like isolated um, mm -hmm. from relations or seems to be. Mm -hmm. Right? It's very much about just owning how we're always relationally codifying ourselves or codifying. Oh yeah, I mean the two pieces yeah. that I read, the two dreams, which were then in my mind installations, were both about that, right? So the yeah. first one is about, of course, you know, the community of say, an imagined community, a, a utopian community yeah. of artists, activists, um, you know, falling and, and, and being lifted and supporting, but then even more importantly is that moment of touch so we talked about that. And there's this line in the book uh, that is a quote from, I forget who, okay. uh, which is, um, uh, the sense of touch makes nonsense out of any dualistic understanding of agency and passivity. And those are big words. And so that, that's that, what that moment of, um, in, the, in the poem of, of the split second between touching and not touching, like, could we really examine that, uh, that space which yeah. is that share? Which is a space of shared um, energy? Yeah, or, you know, matter. In fact, yeah. But I'm curious because you've published ten books, right? You've been around the poetry block mm -hmm. much longer than I have, <laughs> to put it bluntly. And how do you see this kind of resurgence of the lyric? And how do you interact with it? And what's your relationship to that? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot to say about that, and um, I think that you know, it's complicated. Uh, on the one hand, there's this. Um, you know, there's this surge, like, uh, or like, uh, more more visible surge of, um, you know, so-called marginalized or you know people of color writing or you know different, um, you know, where poetry has historically been so exclusive yeah. and so white. I mean, it hasn't, but in terms of its uh, visibility yeah. in a kind of mainstream and audience, it has been. Who gets paid? Who gets a job? Who gets yeah. a book published? Or, from yeah. what publisher, all of those things. So we see that, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the poetry has to be the lyric, right? Yeah. But what it does mean is that um, a broader readership is interested in hearing the narratives yeah. that are coming from a broader range yeah. of kinds of experiences. Yeah. And narrative obviously finds its way through a lyric um, yeah. Voice because a lyric poem is traditionally, obviously, this is not every poem, but yeah. many a lyric poem is a first person narrative about something that is important yeah. to the to that it's writer. It's a song of myself. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, I think there's a longing to hear um, one another's stories yeah. and a broader range of those stories. Yeah, and that produces a readership and audience, right? Yeah, um, and of course. The, writers will respond to that. Yeah. What also is going on though is it has to do with technology and not just social media but um, the ways that uh, online publishing, the ways that poems get published. Yeah. So if you, um, if your goal with the poem as a publisher, let's say you're, you have an online journal or let's say you're even 
a print magazine, but you want your poems to be distributed widely, yeah, yeah. is you got to have something that's going to fit in that photo. Yep. And the photo has to be able to be reproduced um, in, 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 Instagram in Instagram or in Twitter. Yeah. And so if it can't, because it's too long, or it's like too broad, it spreads around, or whatever. Or the meaning is too dispersed. Yeah. It just simply doesn't work in that in that uh, media. Yeah. So honestly, I think a lot of poems that are that get huge amount of circulation yeah. um, work because they are digestible as a, as a narrative. Yeah. They're an important narrative that people need to hear, but then also they fit within the actual yeah. like format. And it's almost yeah. like this is definitely a theory I have, mm -hmm. but in the rise of fascism today, yeah. <laughs> um, or the iteration of it today, sometimes I get afraid that that is a yearning for some a, a simpler meaning, yeah. and a, like like a yearning to have the narrative be contained enough for circulation, right. but also contained enough mm -hmm. to not make you not understand it, right. and be able to like say, okay, this is a narrative of like, so to use myself, so I don't burn any bridges <laughs> um this is a narrative of like a queer um cis female mm -hmm. and her experience with Lyme disease yeah um, right. I get the story right. I feel it now I've right. circulated it right. you know what I mean and then you have to lose all of the things that don't necessarily fit into helping that narrative come across yeah. and that's frightening to yeah. me right you now because like what gets what do you decide gets shaved out mm -hmm. yeah the you complexities know. um I mean from like just for me as a writer, I am interested in this sort of the sort of ways in which different discourses bump up against each other, yeah. right? So like uh, the philosophical discourse, yeah. which I'm a lover of, and not everybody is. Like I, I am. I'm okay <laughs> I mean, with that. I, but I am. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then um, political discourse yeah. and uh, his history, and then lyrical language and troubled language, language yeah. that's you know broken and, and, and non-linear. All of that to me is true to my own being. Yeah. You know, there can be some frustration when at any, you know, in our, like any time yeah. in any art media where when a certain kind of form or a certain kind of voice becomes seemingly dominant. Yeah. But I, like you said, I've been around the poetry world enough or yeah. around the block <laughs> enough times to know that like everything comes in waves and like yeah. that right now it's like this and that. That, that there's some yeah. really good things to take from that and then there's things that will become boring or frustrating to yeah. people and and everybody will be like well we, we didn't really mean for it to get so locked down on yeah. XYZ yeah and anyway everybody's more complicated than that and yeah. then the poems will start to reflect yeah. that again for teaching you know? it can be hard to encourage students explicitly but also then help them express the different incoherent parts of themselves mm -hmm. next to each other yes. or incongruent not incoherent but incongruent or so. or inarticulatable yeah um this came up in a um a, like an artist talk that uh, the really amazing uh, writer mary kim arnold shout out to mary kim arnold mm -hmm. was doing at du um, okay. a couple days ago and uh so she teaches at brown in creative nonfiction, and she was talking about how her students also like pretty much everyone's students right now um, really wanted to talk about identity, but are doing so in, in ways that she felt like were uh, sometimes too limited to what can be articulated yes. and not pushing the language towards what can't quite be languaged, but yeah. can be sort of, um, I don't know, like approximated or where language has to stretch to make a space for it. Yeah. And they were less interested in that and more interested in kind of telling what they already knew yeah. and already knew how to tell. Yeah. And so she was trying to really kind of push them into those more incohate aspects of self. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of articulation mm -hmm. because that also um, implies like when you articulate two things together to yeah. make meaning, mm -hmm. right? So maybe it's a refusal to be articulated with this mm -hmm. particular meaning making mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But total sidebar of like mm -hmm. revisions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna wrap up. Okay. Um, Julie, will you talk more about the installation before we wrap sure. up and where people can learn more about it? Exactly. So. Um as I said, I wrote all of these imagined or hypothetical art installations, and at a certain point in writing all of them, I started to kind of wish to see them in the world. Yeah. I had a fantasy that there could be a museum, yeah. just with every room being one of these installations. Um, and then I thought, oh yeah, wait, well, there is. Yeah. <laughs> it's called the internet. So um, 
<laughs> I reached out to yeah. lots and lots of friends, 40, 40 different artists, some of whom actually were friends of friends, yeah. I didn't know them, and invited people to realize uh, one of the installations. And so I have 36 such realizations. Many yeah. of them are video. I mean, they're all either video or still image, uh, and to audio. Yeah. Um, people could do kind of whatever they wanted. Um, and so all of those installations yeah. exist on a website, which is www.reallifeandinstallation.com. So yeah. yeah, just all cool. those words. And yeah, you can see what people made. I'm really excited about this because A, I teach multimodal poetics, mm -hmm. so students, if you're like, what are projects that we could try out or mm -hmm. look at, that's like a perfect example because yeah. mm -hmm. multimodal lends itself to collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also love that you just were like, they can be. <laughs> done. Yes. And yes. it can be archived online, right. so it's not limited by mobility or the ability to buy a ticket. Right. And that's yeah. really big. Yeah, it's um, just free and open. And, yeah. And, yeah, and I think like uh, just if students are working collaboratively, and there's so many different ways to go, but what I um, decided to do with this project was to uh, invite the collaboration and then uh, and then step away. Like, here's the text. You make the you make the installation. Yeah. Like, however you want to do that. And I didn't edit anybody's work or reject anybody's work. So yeah. it's a very kind of Trusting. open. Um, yeah. I mean, truly, when I perform it. I'll read the text along with the projection. Yeah. But I really try to kind of stay out of the, you know, kind of visually out yeah. of the way. So it's really also an effort to kind of work yeah. towards that sense of of um, movement between that yeah. we've been talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and go nerd out on that online, everybody, because <laughs> that's what I'll be doing. And uh, is there anything else we didn't get to today that you want to make sure we touch on real quick? Uh, check out the Counterpaths website also. So okay. that's, yeah, counterpathpress.org. Okay. So you can see those projects. Perfect. Okay. I want to give everyone a reminder to use the links in the description and check out this amazing work because the ability to see like multimodal poetics, for lack of a better word, that's also very socially engaged without having to buy a ticket, fly or drive is very, very rare. Um, so it'll be an assignment for my students. If you're not one of my students, definitely go check that out. I'm sure it'll be inspiring. Um, the call for comments today, I'm gonna give two options actually. So one is, have you ever done a collaboration before um, with your art specifically, with writing, with other types of artists? If you haven't, what are things that have held you back from doing that? Like what yeah. have been barriers to, to doing that? And then if you don't wanna to respond to that one, the other call for comment is, I'm curious what other writers out there or dancers out there have this relationship between writing and movement. Oh, yeah. Um, because that's like one of my private nerd out mm -hmm. um, items. Mm -hmm. Alright, as always, remember to subscribe and that way eventually I'll get my own URL which would be fabulous. And like this video and go to poetryvlog.com for links to everything from Instagram to Twitter to podcast to the newsletter. The newsletter is primarily updates on what's been happening for people who've been on the vlog. Okay. Um, and then it summarizes whatever came out that month for people who are having a hard time keeping up. Cool. And it's fun. <laughs> so lots of images. Um, all right. Thank all you right. again, Julie. Thank you. It's really fun. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>